Okay, good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, great, the sound is working this evening. Um, welcome to tonight's information session regarding the um, proposed wastewater project here in North Reading. For those of you who don't know, my name is Michael Gilberto and I'm the town administrator here in North Reading. I'm also a resident. I'd like to um, acknowledge a few folks who have joined us, um, two elected officials, Select Board Member Leanne Gonzalez, thank you for joining us this evening, and Community Planning Commission Chair Chris Hayden, uh, also in the front row, thank you for, uh, for joining us. A few other introductions that I'll do before we get started. Um, with us this evening is the town's director of public works, Joe Parisi, the town's acting finance director, Lori Ann Galvin, and consultants from the town's um, designer for this project, uh, Matt Corbin and Michael Stein, who are seated to my right over here. So um, everyone, thank you very much. As Phil from NORCAM mentioned, uh, we are uh, here live in the room and we are also broadcasting via NORCAM and recording for NORCAM as well, which is why the microphones are important. I don't think folks need to get up and go all the way down to the, uh, the podium tonight. I think you can stay right where you're at. We'll just get the microphone to you and you can speak right where you are, are seated. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation that we have used in previous um, conversations and we have been continually updating, so I'm going to go through an updated version of that presentation. And I, I would just start by um, asking that if you have been following along with regard to the project and if you have uh, participated in discussions or if you've heard from your neighbors about the project, um, to the extent that you can come in with a fresh set of eyes because there's a number of things that have changed with regard to this project that will have uh, impacts for, uh, for, for everybody here in town. And you know, I would also ask uh, if you're um, new to the project, maybe you got the mailer with your uh, trash and water bill or you heard from a friend or neighbor uh, about the project, welcome, thank you for coming. Again, um, we have an extensive website on the, uh, that's available uh, dedicating information to the project at www.northreadingma.gov. That's the town's municipal website and there's a red bar right in the front that says wastewater project. I think that covers everything for the housekeeping and if it, that's the case, we'll get going with the presentation. Everybody still hear me okay? Great. So a little bit of history, uh, as many of you know, uh, residential or commercial development in North Reading requires the construction of an on-site disposal or septic system. There's a single parcel of land at the far end of Concord Street connected to the MWRA through the town of Reading. Um, otherwise, there's no available wastewater or public sewer here in North Reading. Many of you know the concept of public sewer in North Reading has been reviewed over the course of many decades with the town at various points and for various reasons electing not to proceed. <clears throat> this most recent iteration was funded uh, for both a preliminary design and for a municipal wastewater financial study at town meeting in October of 2021. And what you're hearing uh, is largely the result of the planning effort that began um, or, or continued after that point. So a little bit about the construction project itself. The project proposes to construct an in-town wastewater collection system to make sewer available on a route that goes from basically the Andover Town line at Main Street, south all the way to the intersection with Park Street on the southern end of town near the Reading Town line. And there are a couple of legs off of that. One would go down North Street by the Town Hall and pick up Lowell Road going to uh, where Martin's Landing and Edgewood are located. Another leg would go down Park Street West towards Wilmington um, and then continuing on Concord Street to the Wilmington town line. And the areas that we've referenced there are largely um, zoned for non-residential use, although there are many residential units along the route, and we'll get to that in a moment. A little bit about how the wastewater would be disposed of. Discussions with Andover and the town of North Andover have been ongoing. The intended route to convey the wastewater would go via Force Main to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District plant in North Andover. The targeted route would go up Main Street, Route 28, continue into Andover, and then follow Route 125 north to Route 114 near Merrimack College. And then from 114, follow a route into the city of Lawrence, and then through into, um, into the plant in North Andover. Um, there are discussions about some potential variation along that route with the communities uh, that's ongoing. Uh, including the possibility of, instead of putting in a new force main pipe, picking up existing collect collection system pipes along the, uh, the route. Uh, and those discussions continue. 
This just gives you an aerial view of the route. You can see the left-hand side is the Andover North Reading Town Line, following Route 28, then up Route 125 to Route 114. And the series of brown, red, and green squiggly lines on the right-hand side are alternative routes through Andover, North Andover, and Lawrence to get to the plant where wastewater would be treated. Yes, sir. Bob Atkinson, uh, 82 Elm Street. And two weeks ago, I attended a meeting about the MassDOT's plans to upgrade Route 114. They're talking that project starting in 2020, April of 2025. That means assuming we get approval from town meeting in May and then the town election for the uh, debt exclusion, you're looking at about a two-year window. Can we get that done and getting it into Route 114 before MassDOT says we can't cut the street open anymore? So that's a, you know, a good question. And the timeline and, in fact, the urgency of the discussion are driven by that project. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we get further. But we are operating right now on a timeline that would allow us to be a participant potentially as part of the project being bid out by the State Department of Transportation or alternatively a construction project that we would oversee alongside them. Um, but that timeline is being entirely driven um, by the project at this point. So for those of you who are wondering what's the rush, that's what's driving the urgency. It's that project and staying ahead of that project because we've been advised that if we don't, to follow that route, we would have a, a multiple year waiting period um, that would put us to about 10 years from now before we would actually be able to put pipe in the road. Um, so there is some urgency that, that we're following with regard to the particular route. And I will be happy to take questions along the way. I'm going to kind of stop at various points in time and ask if there's questions once I finish each section. So if you could just kind of hold on to your questions. Hi, Maureen. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? So I'll uh, continue a little bit. Just about the properties. Um, this is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just, about, yep. just back to what he was saying. Sure. So when is the official date of when that needs to be approved? So we are not only timing with the State Department of Transportation construction timeline, but we're also working off of a timeline with regard to the state sewer revolving fund, which is a financing um, entity that provides low interest loans for projects such as this, and we intend to take advantage of that. Uh, I'm going to look uh, over to the Director of Public Works uh, to answer the issue in terms of the exact dates, because I think that might be, or, or right, Pierce, whoever it might be. I wouldn't let Andrew Mao here on those dates. you want to repeat the question again? What is the date that you need to have approval by. I'm just follow, to follow up with this question. <clears throat> so if you're saying to, to meet this, the, mm -hmm. the timeline, well, no, um, no. we're looking to have uh, a town meeting go no later than uh, June, this June, and uh, uh, I guess the very latest we talked about a September um, ballot vote at the very latest. I think it still puts us uh, in a situation where we could present to MassDOT uh, a set of project plans that would so that's when the vote, but when do you have to notify the other towns? What's that? When do you have to notify the other towns that you're going to call in? That was the vote. That's fine, no. you, you, you were saying you needed to have the vote done by June, but when when do you need to present the, the, the final document, whatever it is, in the, in the you know, fully accepted form? so that they can go ahead with it. When, when, do you, when, when do you need to have an official go ahead document? When you say from the other towns, are you talking about North Andover? And, I'm assuming uh, Andover. That, that, that. Yeah, we're, we're meeting with them on a regular basis. Actually, we've got one scheduled tomorrow with North Andover. Yeah. So, you know, the t discussions continue to sort of narrow down two options that we have through North Andover. If and, you don't uh, have a date certain? So a a date certain that we have to have some agreement with them? Yeah. Um, no, I think it's more of a basic, uh, basic understanding of a route that we're going to um, be working further on with them. We, we have been advised, I believe, that they were, were looking for some indication by December of 2023, this December. That, I recall that date. Their project timeline, and the, the gentleman mentioned they have a meeting, their, project, their timeline has slipped a little bit in terms of a few months. So we're looking at early 2024 in terms of the town of North Reading saying this is the route we would be following and please incorporate it. Yeah, Mr. O'Leary hinted that 
it's been moved from 2023 to 2024. I don't know why, but but that was the day, and I was like, you know, what it, happened? Why? It was December 2023, this December, and you recall we were talking about a town meeting in the fall of last year to allow to, a, a full final design to occur over the course of that year. We sort of slowed that process down. The final design has continued for both a gravity sewer and a um, connecting to existing sewer lines along that route so that we don't miss that timeline. Um, so I think that in terms of the design, we're in pretty good shape for that particular area. The question is, you know, obviously finishing the design of the rest of the project and finalizing agreements with the communities and those discussions continue. Thank you. You're welcome. So a little bit about the property types in the phase one area. Um, the properties, if we were to look purely by the tax bills, 962 are residential condominiums within six complexes on the route. Some of them are on Main Street. Uh, there is one on uh, Martin's Landing over on, uh, on Lowell Road. There are 100 commercial tax bills, 67 commercial condominiums, 62 single family homes uh, concentrated on North Street on, um, and on Park Street and the upper end of Concord Street. Um, and then we have industrial condominiums and then the numbers kind of drop off to a, a number of different other types of projects that are um, you know, smaller in number but you know, that are along the way, including two apartment complexes. Just a summary of the wastewater flows. We're talking about approximately 500,000 gallons of wastewater that we would seek um, the ability to send to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. We have a, an allocation of existing water usage. So it's people who live along the route, businesses along the route that are using water that totals approximately 186,000 gallons per day. We're also reserving 32,000 gallons per day for the Martins Pond area, that's existing water usage. And then there's a reduction that we also allow for any potential groundwater infiltration that could take up some of that flow of just under 30,000 gallons. We have a safety factor, which is sort of a buffer, if you will, of approximately 22,000 gallons. And when you go through that, those deductions off of that total of just over 500,000 gallons, there's about 230,000 gallons available for future growth. The number could vary, particularly if some users in phase one or two elect not to connect to the system, which would make more flow available. So a little bit about why sewer? Why is a project being proposed? Um, First, economic development, and I indicated uh, in a conversation earlier, the area that we've targeted is, has a number of residential properties on it, but it's also the primary area where we have located commercial and industrial properties. The select board believes that making available wastewater collection utility or public sewer in the area would promote an economic development, making more land usable for development and by allowing for more dense development in the commercial and industrial areas. This increased economic development could provide local services and more local job opportunities for the region. The wastewater collection system also makes possible more multifamily housing construction along Main Street, creating the population density to support new business. And the Community Planning Commission has been working over the past five years to identify development pop possibilities for Main Street, and I'll talk about those. So, you know, again, we've shown these photos before. This is the same road, State Route 28, um, Main Street in North Reading, you go over to the town of Andover, this is uh, what the center of Andover looks like. You see a bit more development, more dense development that has um, evolved uh, over decades in that area um, and supported by sewer service. To our south, Reading, which has changed more recently with additional development that's taken place, again, supported by sewer infrastructure. The Planning Commission I just mentioned, they have a conceptual plan for Main and Winter Streets. Uh, they previously worked with Abacus Architects and Planners to develop a plan for key properties in the Main and Winter Street area. So think the area where the old Stop and Shop is, Heavenly Donuts, Kitties. There were two parts, a feasibility study about a potential shared wastewater treatment plant to facilitate redevelopment. And then secondly, concept plans that could show what could be built to the site if a wastewater solution were introduced, accompanied by a possible development program. And there are renderings that I'll go through. The study was intended to be a starting point for discussion about what could be physically and financially possible should the town or private owners choose to pursue redevelopment. And an important thing that I'll just note is 
this study originated when looking for a package treatment plant solution, a small solution to serve only a few parcels in that area. Since that time and after that money was approved, we became aware of this opportunity with the town of Andover and North Andover to go to Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. So I think the renderings are nonetheless relevant, although we're talking about a potentially different wastewater utility here. And so some images, this is one from, uh, from another uh, community, a market in Civic Square. Um, you see there's you know, multi-story buildings that are there. It's a little bit more densely populated. This is an open space near those areas. This is an actual overview of potential development plan for on the left-hand side or center of the screen, the stop and shop property up to the corner where Heavenly Donuts is currently located, as well as the Kitties property on the other side of Winter Street along Main Street. Uh, another scenario where there could be uh, apartments over shops and community buildings surrounding a market hall. Um, intended to invite public events and outdoor dining as well as other activities in the area. Another scenario uh, shows pedestrian street lined with apartments uh, over shops, so a little bit more green space in that large uh, stop and shop parcel area. Um, you see a residential street that crosses the site near Martinsburg as well, kind of on the back side. Another scenario uh, with um, some homes um, and uh, anchoring the center area, um, you know, more dense parking on one side, but more open space on the other. So again, these are not plans for the town to construct this. These were intended to be concepts to show the community, to show potential developers for what could occur at, at a property that is currently being underutilized. Um, another you know, overview, uh, sort of three-dimensional view, uh, looking from um, almost kind of where St. Teresa's is, looking at the, at the property. And just a little bit about sewer. Um, I mentioned River Park. You know, this is uh, a 400 River Park. It's uh, a, a commercial industrial type building that is, um, you know, multiple stories. Um, number of folks that are employed in there. Again, on that, oh, that one parcel that we have here in North Reading with, uh, with wastewater. So I know we've, you know, talked about what can happen. You know, whether folks want that to happen or not is a different issue, but this is an example, you know, located on Concord Street here in North Reading, serviced by wastewater that happens to go through the town of Reading. Um, similar, uh, we've talked about Market Street. Um, town of Linfield has significant areas that are not sewered. Market Street is. There was an expansion that was done from the town of Wakefield with the MWRA's cooperation in 2000, I think 10-ish. Um, to pick up wastewater flow, which allowed for the development to occur. And again, I think everyone's probably you know, seen this area. This is a, a sort of common space over at Market Street. So again, why sewer? We talk about the environment. The wastewater collection system helps promote public health and environmental protection by improving the water surface and uh, groundwater quality, but also providing a long-term solution for wastewater management, rather than relying solely on septic systems or in-town treatment facilities. <coughs> I'll continue through just a little bit more about why sewer. This is the financial aspect of it. Uh, the town hired, uh, with the appropriation from town meeting, FXM to do an analysis of potential commercial, industrial, multifamily, residential growth in the sewer district. And it's based upon projected demand in the surrounding sewer towns. So they looked in the nearby area uh, to come up with some information. Their assumptions were based on a constant tax rate of about $15 per thousand dollars of valuation. That was last year's tax rate. You may remember in November, the select board approved a new um, uh, tax levy, which included a $13.99 tax levy, so it went down about a dollar and one cent. It's not a feasibility study. It was only intended for long-term planning purposes. And the conclusion that they you know, provided to the board and the study is available on the town's website is that there is sufficient demand within the market area to absorb the projected commercial square footage potential and the number of residential units that are projected. And I'll talk more about what the, what, 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 what the amounts were. So again, revenue for services. This is a summary of their findings for the potential financial in, in, impacts. And spread across the retail, industrial, and flex space and office space, the total potential increase in the value of the existing properties was $190 million of value uh, by putting sewer in place. So that is properties whose value improves by virtue of having sewer available to them. 
There's a second piece, which I know I've talked a lot about, but I'm going to try to explain a little bit further, which is the potential for new growth. So that is new tax revenue caused by somebody developing their property or making improvement to their property. So when we're talking about the first group of funds, we're talking about how the tax obligations for the community are spread. Are they more on the residential? Are they more on retail, industrial, or office space? The bottom part is new revenue, new tax revenue that comes in by virtue of a project that somebody's done on their property. And again, across all of the categories, retail, industrial, and flex, or office space, approximately two and a half million square feet of potential development, property values increasing on new growth to the amount of $902 million, and tax revenues of $13.5 million, uh, potentially a new growth revenue. And we'll talk more about the new, the new growth. So these are potential numbers. They're not guarantees. These are things that the market study ind indicates could happen based on the available capacity and demand in the market in our area. It's not a global look. It's a North Reading-centric look for demand. There's another aspect of it, and it's residential. And we know that you know, a lot of the development we've seen in the community has been residential property, multifamily development. Um, the potential for 1,302 new units with property values of just about $700 million and a tax revenue benefit of approximately $10 million. So you know, on this page, I've talked about $13 million. On this page, it's about $10 million combined at $23 million between the two um, for potential revenue. And I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further into that, but hopefully not too far into it for folks. So why is that important? Why, why is the, the, the prospect of potential additional revenue important? And it's because, and some of you were either at or probably heard me speak at the select board meeting on Monday night, we have significant financial pressures to continue providing the services that the community enjoys today. We, for the past few years, have benefited from new growth in the form of a few small subdivisions with really expensive homes that have brought additional tax revenue and multifamily development, such as Martin's Landing, which brought uh, or will bring uh, approximately 500 units of new construction. That has helped us to sustain services over the course of the past five to 10 years. Um, but those, that development is slowing down. Martin's Landing, uh, where I know a few folks in the room probably live, um, a beautiful development. They are seeing some of the struggles with regard to the interest rates and the impact on construction. They have notified the town that they're gonna be slowing down their rate of construction. So we've done a projection. This is based on 20 years of history with our current service levels, meaning what we're currently providing today for services to the community in our departments, and without having any sewer. And you see that it looks balanced on the left-hand side. The red and the green are at the same level. Um, the reality is that doesn't happen without a lot of struggle between the school committee, the select board, and the finance committee, and all of our departments to balance the budget. And when you look out, the projections are that there's a gap that grows. And it grows to the point of in 2028, which would roughly be where we would see uh, the first use of the sewer being able to occur. There's a roughly $1.8 million gap between our projected revenue and what it will cost to continue running the town in the way that it runs today. Not in how it needs to run in three years from now, but how it runs today in 2023. That number grows to 2033 to about $4.7 million. And by the time you get to 2043, 20 years out, it's just under $18.5 million in a projected gap between how much the town can expect to have in revenue in the form of state aid, um, our local receipts from fees in the town hall, and of course, property taxes. So it's a significant concern for us and something that the select board wants the community to be aware of, that I want the community to be aware of as we're considering this, and but all of our financial decisions as well. Um, any questions about that, about the, the finances or that end of it? Mr. DeNaro? Yeah, I, I have just one question. The, um, when, when you had the report about uh, potential growth in the different areas, um, was there any breakdown for Main Street, Park Street, and Concord Street? In terms of the parcels or the potential, yeah, yeah, potential growth in those, uh, I'm going to look to the DPW director. I don't remember seeing it broken down that way. Uh, it, it was not broken down by the street. But it, it is what it does reflect is the existing zoning. So we have not assumed that property has been rezoned to allow high rises or anything 
of that nature. Um, I'm sure there's a way to try to break it down in terms of a, of a value by parcel, but I, I don't know how accurate it would be because some parcels are already fully developed, others are significantly underdeveloped. Well, I mean, there could be a house that you tear down and sure. build up three story, it's, it's worth three times as much, but, yes. but um, you know, it, it'd be important to me to understand you know, what the significance of Concord Street is, because it goes by my property to get mm -hmm. to Concord Street. To me, I look at it and there's businesses everywhere there. Now you mentioned at one meeting, I think it was last year, that that the that the back area by the pond that's that's when you first when you first hit the the businesses in Cocker Street going going west, you know the pond on the right. Mm -hmm. um, somebody said that behind there was all septic system, and it'd be nice to be able to put a building back there. Oh, does anyone remember that? I'm not familiar with with that particular. So I'm just wondering, you know, how important is Concord Street to the whole scheme of getting. I, I can tell you that in the analysis of the, of the breakdown of a previous study, um, I recall the proportions being about one third to two thirds. So when you looked at Main Street, it was about two thirds of the potential upside of new growth. When you looked at Concord Street, it was about one third of it. That's my general recollection. From and what would Park Street probably be the same thing? I, I don't know that there's a ton that's expected on Park Street, yeah. candidly, because it, I don't think that there's going to be much by way of change in use. There was a large parcel that has already been developed as single family homes, Shea Lane, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, I, I think there's always the potential of a property, you know, somebody could acquire and tear down a house. They could, you know, lot split um, if they had a large enough property. But I, I just, I'm not sure that there's a ton that's there. And certainly not the targeted area. Mm -hmm. because I, the areas are really Main Street and Concord Street that we're looking okay. at. And then I have a question for Mr. Parisi. Um, I've got a friend who's been on select boards in, in, in Vermont, a whole different thing from North Reading. Um, uh, up there, what they do, if you if you have an agreement with the town, they just go into the nearest uh, manhole, connect up to it, and it goes out because they probably don't have that much, that much flow. Correct? Does that make sense to you? You're saying that homes would go would connect to an existing the whole, system the whole through town, a manhole. The whole town would 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 agree to make a deal with that next town, and and, and he said they would just tie into the closest manhole, and and it'd be like intravenous and you know they they're both tied in. Now that would seem to me that they'd have to have enough extra capacity for that to happen. Correct. Um, is that is is with our reduced capacity because we're not going town wide with septic? Is is there the possibility of connecting into North Andover or Andover, and then when it comes time to add additional additional um, um, flow, then then you know you you haven't torn up the street the first time. You just tied into right. it. So the, I guess the short answer is um, is no. Um, the permit that we have is 500,000 gallons per day, which uh, when you look at that flow at its maximum, it could be out 30 years from now, granted. But when you look at that flow, uh, it does require uh, upsizing a significant amount of uh, existing uh, gravity sewer lines in, in Andover and in North Andover as well. So either route that we take in Andover or North Andover um, through their existing gravity systems requires upgrades of their existing gravity lines and because there's been a lot of uh, disruption to certain streets in both communities for the gas explosions that a lot of that's been put back in place at this point in time you know some years later and there's reluctancy to have us go um, into their system through routes that would you know basically tear up those same roads again mm -hmm. so when we have opportunity to you know get into this system we're very limited to the route that you know the, our sewer flow would go to, to avoid these streets and, and potentially give us a, an opportunity to, to upgrade, upsize their pipes, uh, and improve their roads at the end of the project. I guess to some degree. Um, so that's what we're trying to work out. Is there a route that's, you know, uh, acceptable to the town of Andover or North Andover that doesn't, you know, start um, ripping up their roads again that they've already seen, you know, damage in. in um, and uh, construction to put it all back together. Thank you. OK. 
Okay, so I, again, I spoke a little bit about new growth. Uh, we're not purposely trying to make this difficult to read. We're just showing that we have a pretty detailed spreadsheet that went into the information that's here. I'm going to move past it. This, by the way, this presentation will be posted on the town website, as has every other prior presentation. So if you're, you you know, want to refer back to it, you'll be able to do so tomorrow. Um, so this is a, some snapshots of information from that larger spreadsheet. And again, just showing this is at the 100% growth level. Whether or not that occurs and the timeline in, under which that occurs is nearly impossible to predict. Um, but what we are showing you here is what the average new growth tax rate would be attributed to sewer. And what we're trying to show, you know, between the columns here is basically what you see in bold. That when you go to that third year of us paying the debt service on the project, which is 2028, there's roughly $1.6 million in new tax revenue that's projected. And this is apportioning all of the development over 30 years. Um, it grows quickly because the, that new tax revenue becomes part of the tax base. It increases each year by 2.5% as allowed by law. Um, and then it's added to by any new growth in that next year. So it, it, it compounds on, on itself. Getting to in year 28, the year 2053, just under $27 million in additional revenue. So the point is there is significant growth potential, significant potential for change along Main Street and Concord Street, and also a potential significant financial um, impact for the community. Um, we've sort of showed these at prorated. So what if only 75% of all of that growth that was highlighted happened? You see it goes up to about $20 million in the last year for new revenue. And when you get to 50%, it goes to about $13 million um, on, the, on the, the, the end. And that growth continues, by the way. After that year, we just showed a snapshot in time to align with the years that we would be paying back um, on a, a loan, a bond, uh, to finance this. And again, 25% is a smaller number, about $6.8 million. And again, can't stress enough, that's, at, you know, that's taking all of the, the development that drove the projections I just spoke of from our study with FXM. Um, and saying, okay, what if only 25% of that happened, and what if it happened evenly over the 25, the 30-year period? It could be that you have very aggressive development happening in the first few years. It could be that it takes longer. It just depends upon how, how things develop and, and what decisions we make with regard to zoning um, to allow that to happen. So a little bit about how we pay for sewer, um, and this is, um, you know, would be a significant impact for all of us um, as taxpayers. Um, this is the breakdown. It's a $129.1 million construction project. About $74 million of it is the cost of getting the flow, the wastewater flow, and pumping it out of town to the plant at Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. Roughly $55.5 million is the amount of money it costs us to establish a system of pipes to collect it from the properties along the route. I'm going to talk a little bit about something called the SRF loan. Uh, the important point here is about $113 million of this cost is eligible for funding with that SRF loan, and I will explain that. About $16.5 million is not eligible for it, and that, that'll come back to some projections that I'm going to show you. Additional financing that's out there, we've been notified of an earmark of $1.5 million in federal funding from our congressional delegation, along with $250,000 in funding for continued design and permitting that's earmarked for the town. It's anticipated that these grants would reduce the amount that we would borrow, so that $129 million, we would take that off the top and not borrow it. Additionally, the town does have available for potential use approximately $15 million from the sale of town-owned land in the form of the former Berry property, now being developed as Martin's Landing, and $4 million from our American Rescue Plan Act funding. This is an outdated slide because we don't intend to utilize that funding at this point in time. So it's $15 million for the state of the sale of town-owned land. The SRF, uh, the town's been notified that the wastewater project has been included on the Massachusetts State Revolving Fund SRF program on their 2023 draft intended use plan. It's a federal state partnership that provides communities low cost financing. Design costs, land purchases, and administrative costs and fees are not eligible. Construction costs are. For eligible costs, the standard terms are 2% interest for a 20 year repayment period or 2.4% for a 30 year period. Any non-eligible project cost is financed at the market um, interest rate, which could be between 3.5 and 5%, depending upon the 
type of financing that you've heard of um, in, or, or seen recently. The initial project borrowing would require a short-term interest-only bond anticipation note at current market interest rate. A year and a half ago, the SRF was not really an important part of the conversation because interest rates were really low. Now, interest rates are, of course, very high. And so this being available to us and the fact that we've been accepted into the program is a significant step to try to maintain uh, and control the cost to the extent that we can. Again, another spreadsheet, not intending to make it difficult <laughs> for people to read it, but just want folks to know this is a borrowing schedule. So imagine you know, if you had your mortgage on your home, you go to the bank, they give you a repayment schedule with annual payments that you make over a 20, 25, 30 year period, depending upon the length of your mortgage. This is our version of that, the town's version of a repayment schedule provided by our financial advisors. And it's broken down by the 120, 112 million that's eligible for SRF and 16 and a half million that would not be eligible for it. So a question that we've heard is, can the town even do this? Meaning, would we be allowed to do it? And the short answer is yes, we are allowed to incur the debt associated with this type of project. Our current debt limit is approximately $180 million, and with state approval can be doubled to $360 million. Our outstanding debt authorized but not issued is about $15 million, leaving capacity, or an amount that we could borrow, of $165 million under the normal limit. And if we doubled it, it's $345 million. All of that said, having the capacity to do so should not be confused with our ability to support the payment of additional debt service within our tax levy. And you're going to hear that we can't. Um, so municipal finance, a debt exclusion, and some of you have heard that. What does that mean? You might commonly have heard it referred to as an override, Proposition 2 and a half override. A debt exclusion is a vote that we can exclude from what the state limits for our ability as a town to raise in property taxes debt service for a capital project such as this. The exclusion remains in effect for the life of the debt only. What does that mean? If this was voted, once the project's paid off, the payment goes away. The town can't say, oh, we're going to start using the money for this or for that. It's only related to the specific project that it's financing. And the building that we are sitting in is the most recent example of it. Uh, we had a debt exclusion vote that the community voted twice um, to approve um, in terms of funding. Um, where there was an override, if you will, of the limits on how much can be raised in property taxes, and that amount continues to be paid by all of us as taxpayers. Once the building is paid off, um, that debt exclusion goes away. Um, just to summarize it, a project funded by a debt exclusion is paid for by raising property taxes townwide above and beyond what would normally be able to be raised in a given year or years. So before I finish that, you know, I would love to be standing here and say to everybody, hey, we don't have to have a debt exclusion vote. We have the ability to pay back debt service, to pay off the loan year in and year out without having to ask you to pay any more in taxes. The problem with that is that we don't have that capability without having a dramatic impact on the services that we all enjoy as residents, including police, fire, DPW, our schools. We just don't have that capability to absorb it. Our current municipal budget is approximately $80 million when you include our enterprises. $6 million, a significant chunk of money. And as I mentioned earlier, we are already under financial pressure and thus the need to request a debt exclusion to fund this. So let's talk a little bit about the impact. The debt exclusion property tax amount, um, to make it simple, it's $1.50 per $1,000 of assessed property valuation. So you take the value of your home, divide it by $1,000, and multiply it by $1.50. And that will give you the idea. Not the value that you have on Zillow or on Redfin or somewhere else, but the value that we have your property assessed at on your tax bill. Uh, that's how you come up with that calculation. For the average home in North Reading, and I'm not sure that there's any one that is valued at that amount, but when you average them all together at $745,319, it's about $1,116 for uh, the tax bill, an increase in the tax bill each year for the life of the borrowing. That's averaged. Some years it'll be a bit lower, some years a little bit higher, but that's the average. Mr. Denaro, you have a question? So, so are you saying that the shortfall, if you went ahead with the project, is, is $1.50 per 1,000 of property in the, in the town? The shortfall on the... On the uh, on the uh, balance sheet if we were to approve the project 
that's the amount we would need to raise in addition in order to pay off that loan, yes. Right. The shortfall being created by the project. So if you had other sources, you, you got, you, you're pretty sure of getting some money in, it's maybe only 1.6 million or something like that, it's not gonna do much, but so you, you, could, you could look at what you have and what's possible that could be coming in with, with different things you have forward thinking. But, uh, but that's what it is on day one. If you really didn't go and do that, it'd be a dollar fifty per. If, if this was the only way to pay for this project, if there was no um, connection fee associated with it, if it was just going to be um, a project paid for raising taxes, that's the amount that it would be one thousand one hundred sixteen dollars for the average home, or a dollar fifty per thousand dollars of valuation. There are things that may have an impact on that, and I'll, I'll, I'll come through that, but they all serve to potentially reduce that amount, not increase it. So I'm just gonna speak a little bit about a couple of assumptions that, that we've incorporated in this, and these are not necessarily final, but they are scenarios that we've chosen to put forth. We can reduce how much that debt exclusion needs to be basically by borrowing less. How, how do we, you know, if you were buying a home and you're making a down payment, you can reduce your mortgage payment by putting more down against the cost of the, of the home. And this is a scenario that we've developed. Um, we have available funds from the sale of the former JT Berry property of uh, between 14 and $15 million, as well as the state and federal grants that I mentioned, about $1.75 million. If we were to take those and reduce the amount borrowed, two things happen. The first is that we're actually able to wipe out that borrowing at the market interest rate. So I talked about the SRF program as a financing way at low interest rates, and then I talked about the balance, it was about $16 million, that we had to basically go to the bank and ask for money. By utilizing this amount of money, we no longer have to go to the standard bank and say we need money. We're only going through the state sewer revolving fund program, borrowing at that lower interest rate. Um, there's different opinions about whether to do that or not, and we certainly, I think, will continue to have conversation. But if that approach were followed, it would reduce the amount for the debt exclusion to $1.28 per $1,000 of assessed property value. Or for that average home, it goes to about $956 per year averaged over the 30 year period of time. So we were asked to show that in one of the previous information sessions and we've done that. I wanna be clear, there isn't a policy decision that's been made one way or the other. I do think that the Polte or Martin's Landing JT Berry funding, I'm calling it, it's all, it's all the same pot of money, about $15 million. I do see that being utilized towards this project. Um, but one scenario is to basically say, look, we could take advantage of not having to borrow at that higher interest rate by using that, those funds. I do wanna be clear, we, this is not the only money we have in the piggy bank. We have stabilization funds that town meeting transfers money into at virtually every town meeting um, that are there for so-called rainy day. There are restrictions on that funding from the sale of town-owned land. We can only use it for capital, capital and debt service purposes. So we can't go and grant raises to town employees, for example, or um, it, for that matter, um, sustain services that are recurring you know, year in and year out. Um, we can't hire teachers. We can't hire DPW workers. Debt service or paying back a loan on something that we borrowed to buy or actually using it to buy a capital item. Those are the only two uses for that funding. So this is just another way of looking at that debt exclusion property tax impact. The, the table on the top shows you the total project cost. It shows you a combination of the SRF and market rate borrowing on lines three and four. And when you go through and look at the average debt service, again, it's about $6.3 million. Apportioned into a debt exclusion, it would be $1,116. If we were to go forward and utilize the Polte funding and the, the, the grants, which the grants will get utilized either way, we reduce that amount by about $160 to $956 for the average single family home. So I'm gonna stop just about the property taxes and, and what we put forth here. Any, uh, any questions on that? We've kind of gone through that in pretty good detail. So I'm gonna talk about a new term um, and uh, if you were here in a previous meeting or if you were reading online or if you were at town meeting, you heard um, the word betterment. And to be very clear for those who are in the room or watching on NORCAM, 
town meeting has taken votes that put restrictions on betterments, and further, the select board has taken a vote not to utilize betterments for funding this project. So what that means is, for a property owner along the route, in a previous discussion in the fall of 2022 and even early, early, earlier this year, you heard conversation about your property being assessed a betterment. And what that meant, it meant you had to pay the tax bill that I just described, and you had to pay an additional amount of money whether you connected or not. That's not happening now. So if you live along the route and you never choose to connect, your obligation is in your tax bill, like every other resident of North Reading, you're only asked to pay additional funding if you choose to connect to the system. So we've termed this system development fee and we've grabbed and used that language to describe it because it's exactly what we do for our existing water system. We have a property in town that's not connected to the water system and you want to access public water in North Reading, you are assessed a system development fee. You're only assessed it when you come into the DPW and say, I'd like to build a new home, I'd like to connect it to the water system, we charge you the fee, give you the permit, you pay, you pay, you get the permission to connect, and you're in and part of the water system, and you pay uh, you pay a user fee in the term in, the, in terms of a water utility bill on a quarterly basis. State law allows us to assess this, be, again beyond the debt exclusion to property owners who choose to connect to the sewer system. Fees only charged when a property owner chooses to connect to the system. I'll say that one more time only charged when you choose to connect to the, water, to, to the, to the wastewater system. <clears throat> the fee may be discounted to property, owner, to property owners who choose to connect uh, to the system at different points in time. The town currently is charging this fee to those who are connecting to our water system. The select board, again, no longer considering the use of betterments which are charged to property owners regardless of whether they connect. That is not on the table. What is being discussed is a debt exclusion and the potential um, use of system development fees to properties along the route should they choose to connect. So this is a system development fee scenario and I, I want to be clear this is not something that is finalized at this point. We just reviewed this for the first time at the select board meeting on Monday evening. But what you basically, what the concept is, is looking to take a portion of the project that could potentially be funded by system development fees, by people who choose to connect. So the way that works is you set a percentage, and we've put on here on the left-hand side 5% all the way up to 50%, and then you set a rate. And if you were in previous meetings, we were talking about that rate being the amount for a single family home, regardless of how many bedrooms you had, you had and regardless of where you were located, and then also for a condominium, regardless of how many bedrooms you had and regardless of where you were located. That has also changed. What's now before you is a per bedroom schedule for fees. So if you had a one bedroom condominium, you would pay the dollar amount that you see in any one of those boxes depending upon the year that you connected and the percentage. You had two bedrooms, you would pay double that amount. If you had three bedrooms, you'd pay three times and so on and so forth. I'll also note that this is developed using Title V. Why is that important? Because we all have septic systems and they're all based off of Title V. It's a state law that governs the design of wastewater treatment when you build a septic system. Utilizing this, it more closely aligns with existing uses on properties, but also allows for the potential variation that can happen on those properties as well. So I'm gonna pick a scenario, just for discussion purposes, I'm gonna pick the one that's right in the middle, 25%. So if we were to make a determination that we wanted to ask people who choose to connect in the future to pay a total of 25% of the project cost, what that would look like is up to $8,103 per bedroom. And we could make a determination that that's gonna be the price period, but the more likely scenario that the select board has discussed is discounting that the sooner that you connect. So in the table that you're looking at here, if you were to connect in the first five years of after the, the project has taken place, your rate would be $3,333 per bedroom. So if you had a three bedroom home, it would be $10,000. If you had four bedrooms, it would be uh, a little over $13,000, almost $14,000. So you, you have, you have a, a scenario where it's determined based upon what you have for your existing septic system, which we found to, uh, and based on feedback, seemed to be more what the community was looking to, to, to show. This is a model, 
it hasn't been approved. These numbers could vary, but this is the concept that the select board received for the first time on Monday evening um, and is considering. And I do think that the two things that are likely to happen is that there will be a per bedroom assessment that takes place and that there would also be a discounting the sooner that you choose to connect. Um, that's something that I, I, we've heard from the community. We want incentive, we want, we, we, the feeling is, regardless of your feelings about whether or not you want to see the development that could happen, as a property owner, if you own property on the route, this is adding value to your property. And we want you to be encouraged to participate in it and take advantage of it. And so by discounting the rates, um, that's a, a scenario where we, we, we think we can try to do that. The downside to this, again, no guarantees. We don't know how many people are going to connect or when they're, connect, when they're going to connect, but this provides a scenario and an option for people to voluntarily connect. I picked 25% because it was in the middle. We had one board member on Monday night who was suggesting it be 5% on the lower side. Others might feel that it needs to be on the, on the higher side. That's something that can be determined. It probably shouldn't be a determining factor about whether the town does this project because those revenues are not guaranteed. Ultimately, it comes down to the debt exclusion and our decision about whether to increase our taxes and whether we're interested in the vision that folks have for Main Street and for Concord Street. So I'm going to stop there because I know that's a new concept that's been out there. I'm going to say it one more time too. There is no betterment being discussed. No mandatory per property fee at this point. Uh, it's been taken off the table. Mr. Denaro. I forget the question. Um, um, but I'm happy to hear about the better because that was one of my questions tonight. Madam Chair said it three times and I didn't hear anyone say second it, but it was, it's still on the website, the North Reading website. They should put a disclaimer up there or something because you may not be able to change the wording in the, in the, uh, in, in the uh, um, consultant's report. Appreciate that. Thank you. But it's mentioned in there. So disturbing to me to see that there. The, um, my question just came back to me. Do you have information that would say you've met your, your, um, your um, target income from residents opting in? How, how many, what, do you know the percentage of, of homes you would need in order to satisfy what your goals are, financial goals are? We know the number financially, right? Um, and the irony of having, financially, the irony of this setup is to get the maximum amount of money to come in, you want everybody to connect in the last, in the, on the 30th year, because that's the maximum rate. The problem with that is you have no connections happening over the years. So there's a balance that we're going to have to strike financially. We want people to connect. We need flow in the system for it to be um, productive. But do, do you have ready, actually written down goals and need, we need to get this much by this month, 2026 and so on? Uh, so, so our projections are based on even distribution, to make that clear. Um, the goals in terms of a minimum, I'm going to look to the engineers just for a moment in terms of the functionality of the system. We've, the model we've used is 100,000 gallons. That's sort of a working model that the DBW directors looked at. Whether you know, we're able to do so at a lower number, <coughs> something we have to get back to folks on. Whether it, it would operate at yes. a lower number? Yes. Yes, it will operate at a lower number. Okay. I think the question is how low can that number go? Well, I don't care. I don't care what the number is. I want to know that you have done the, the homework so that you can rally the troops and say we need to get to this amount of money because it's going to f affect the rest of us in town, maybe who have already connected, but other people aren't, or this or that. So any 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 time you can't meet, you you know you can't give your own people a um, incentive to bring people on. So the Except incentive is in having the discounted rate, the low rate in the first years afterwards. Um, th I think that's really you know, what it comes down to. You know, we can try to project the rate that it will happen at. We're trying to encourage it. I, th I think it's unfortunate, and, and I think all of us will take whatever level of responsibility we have that the focus became about a betterment and that a wastewater system became a bad thing for the property owners along the route because it really should be a good thing for the property owners along the route. And um, we're trying to encourage people to connect to it. 
Um, what happens if somebody sells their property along the 30-year run? They haven't put it in. It's six years after the line's been, been, you know, there's no requirement for them to put it in. How can you hold them to do it? Or is there a way? So they, they, they haven't connected? They haven't connected. They would retain the ability to connect in accordance whatever. But if they sold it, would the new owner or the existing owner have to pay that? They would, they would not have to, no. If they chose to connect, they could, but only if they chose to. So it's not like a betterment where it's okay. leaned on a property. So it's, it, truly, it a truly property. comes down to then that if the homeowner could see a true benefit, like they're going to expand, add a couple of houses on their property, take advantage of it, let's say, for instance, that, that, they, would, that they would connect to it. It would be their choice to. Right, okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hayden, do you, I saw your hand go up. You must remember when you sell a property in Massachusetts, you have to do a Title V if you're on septic. Mm -hmm. And at that point, these numbers are very nice. If you're going to look at a, a decent system in North Reading today for, a, say, a four-bedroom house, you're probably in excess of $20,000. For the, for the cost of that system. Plus, then you have to pump it every two years to keep it viable. Thank you, Chris. So, so that actually leads to the, the, the next slide, which we, we get asked a lot, and there's a lot of discussion about how much it costs to replace a septic system. The short answer is a range between twenty-five dollars and $50,000 based upon local contractors, a design engineer here in town, um, and another uh, uh, local design engineer as well. So quite a bit of information that kind of led us to those numbers. Sir. Yeah, Mr. Atkinson again. Uh, I can speak to that. We just replaced my septic system in 2019. It cost us $23,000. And if I had had the choice to connect that six grand to a sewer main, case closed. But I don't have that option because I'm, I'm not going to be benefiting from this project in any event because I'm a quarter mile from the Thompson Club sure. on the east side of town. But... Yeah, I can speak to those numbers. Sure. And, and I just, just the point Mr. Nero made, you know, with her, was, was raising about the requirement to pay or to connect. Um, you know, again, full transparency, and some of you have heard this directly from the Board of Health. They have indicated that it could consider requiring properties along the route that experience total or significant septic system failure to connect to the system, in which case having this option is advantageous for the property owner. Um, They've also indicated that it may keep consider requiring properties along the route to um, that seek to expand or to uh, construct additions to connect to the system. Again, they have not made a policy determination. That's their initial feedback about what they would require. The Board of Health has also indicated it would be unlikely to require properties along the route that require septic system repairs to connect to the system. So some of you have dealt with this. You have an issue with the distribution box on your system where the, or you have a pump in there that's pumping up to your leach field. A failure like that, they've indicated, would not be something they would require folks to connect to the sewer because it can be very easily fixed. Um, I will note systems over 10,000 gallons per day, and we have them in North Reading at condominium complexes and elsewhere, they are outside the Board of Health jur jurisdiction and they're regulated by the state. So the requirements would be driven by the, uh, the state. Sir. Just so I got it straight. There's no charge to go by the house. Correct. The hookup was on the home. That don't work anyway, so just no sense. It's, no, it's for the TV. Huh? It's for TV. Oh, sorry, TV. <laughs> so there's no charge to go by the house. Correct. We could use it in here. Let me know. You can hardly hear these guys. Now, the hookup is on the homeowner, right? Yes. Case closed. So if he decides to stay there for 20 years, it's not costing him any, and everything works right, there's no charge. Only the debt exclusion being shared town-wide. I don't know what that means. It's the property tax increase that we're talking about, being shared by every taxpayer in North Reading. So there's nothing's coming out of the homeowner's pocket except his tax bill. Correct. If, I had a question, but I lost it. I got CRS, but anyway, thank you. I'll, if you think of it, raise your hand. Except if some, if the town uh, condemned your oh, I got that septic right. system, you know. So the old way they used to do this, they charge you by going by the house. Correct. And you had a minimum amount of time to hook up. Correct. Neither one of those prevail anymore. 
That's correct. Unless you got a problem. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, a little bit more for those of you who might have property that you're considering developing along the route. The Community Planning Commission does have regulations that require lots in a new subdivision to connect to sewer if it's available within a thousand feet of the development. So somebody walks in and says, I'm going to build five lot subdivision. For those of you who live along the route, think Shea, you know, Shea Lane, there's a few more homes than five on there. Um, there could have been a requirement to connect to the system in order for that development to happen. Um, where the town does have a sewer line planned, but not constructed per a comprehensive sewer plan, the subdivision developer is required to design and install sewerage laterals, which can be connected later to the public sewerage system in the street and to every lot. So what does that mean? Somebody tries to come in right now and develop, we have a plan in place. They would be required to put a pipe in the ground with the ability to connect should it occur. Again, that is for somebody looking to construct a subdivision. You take their property, divide it up into multiple house lots, build homes and sell them off. Um, not somebody in an existing home right now who's looking to just stay in their home and keep their property as is. The final note I'll just make on the regulations is the Planning Commission's regulations require all developments that fall under their site plan review. And some of you, I think, may have been notified with the redevelopment of the turkey farm of uh, site plan review that took place. Um, you get a notice in the mail. You get asked to come down. It's not really about whether or not the development happens. It's more about how it takes place and what the design of the property looks like and where the parking might be. Um, if it's within um, 1,000 feet of a property, of, of a sewer line, that property would also be required to connect. So again, trying to target where there's somebody who's looking to develop and presumably generate income or profit off of their property. Those are situations where both our Board of Health and the Community Planning Commission, in the case of the Planning Commission, they already have the regulations in place, would expect that a plan be made to connect to the sewer. Could you ex explain the 1,000 foot? Sure. Um, you mentioned 1,000 feet might be the maximum. Is that current? You just come up with you just. No, that's currently in place. It's been in place for a number of years, I believe. And what does that mean? Because I may be 1,000 feet. If you own a lot that you are thinking. Well, my house, it's a prince. I'm, th I'm, I, I'm think I'm, I'm approximately 1,000 feet from the street. Okay. So what would happen in that case? So if you, had a, if you had land, if you had enough land that you were subdividing your property, you're going to draw out three house lots in it and build three house lots where you only have one. I see some nodding, so you follow what I'm saying. In that scenario, you, the Planning Commission's regulations would require that you connect to the sewer. But what would you say about the 1,000 feet? If you're, because you would be within 1,000 feet. I assume it's your property. I thought you were saying feet. if you exceeded 1,000 feet, you couldn't tie into the sewer. So I thought you were saying. I, the, the, so the requirement is for somebody looking to do a development within 1,000 feet. You're asking if you're beyond 1,000 feet. Is yeah. that right? So I think that that's something that we'd have to make a determination. I think a big factor would be, is there sufficient flow? Um, does the property in question touch the street? Yes. So your house is more than 1,000 feet back, but right. But the property is a lot. Right now there's a septic system, there's a, there's a overflow, okay. and, and there's a leaching field about 200 feet away so towards, not towards the street. Not to put him on the spot, but I, Mr. Hayden is on the Planning Commission, and I, I do believe you would be required to connect, because you would. I think the thousand feet is your property to the, to the sewer line, not your house. So your property is right on the street. No, no, it's a thousand feet back. But the property. Does it, does any of your property, any of the, the land, touch the street? Oh yes, it does. Yeah, I I, I think you're going to find that you be you would be required because you front the street. Your frontage is on the street. I don't know if I said that. It, it, if if you have frontage on the street where the sewer line is and your project is within a thousand feet of that you need to connect if it's a subdivision okay. if it's not a subdivision what happens if it's not a subdivision in your single family house you never have to connect as long as your septic is in good shape if you sell your home and you do a title five test on it and it says that you need to replace the system, then you can either replace the septic system or put a pipe in across your property and connect to the sewer line. Well, I'm also 25 feet down from the street. Mr. DeNaro, just to be clear, is the question 
talking about a, a large parcel of We're talking about, about, about well, how it would affect me to, to connect into that. It's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. Okay, I, but are you talking about your, do you have a single family home? Single family home. It's the only house on your parcel of land? Correct. Are you intending to change that? Not right now, but, but the, you know, I, I could. So you could potentially divide your property into two lots and build an additional yeah. home. Do I follow that correctly? I have to kick the horses out. <laughs> <laughs> so in that, in th that, that could be a scenario where you could be required to connect. Yeah. And I don't want to sugarcoat that. If you're going to create an additional house on the lot and it's within, it's on a parcel that's within a thousand feet of the, the sewer line, you, you may trigger this requirement. Even if it's not a subdivision, and I, I know we all talk about subdivision, it could be, that, that's, a, that's a term under, um, under state law, it's a technical term. Some people are just, they just draw a line right up the middle of their property through an A&R plan, approval not required. And split their lot. I think in that scenario, if a site plan was required for it, which it probably would be, you'd be required to connect. Yeah. I guess I'm concerned about the cost to, to connect to the pipe could be uh, equal or, or one one and a quarter times more than the cost to connect of of uh, paying for the pipe to come up the street in the first place, because you'd have to pump up 25 feet and then and then 800 feet or 1,000 feet. And probably have to have a macerator. I mean, I have a pump now, but it just pumps fluid. Yeah, there's going to be all sorts of <clears throat> different costs within the specific properties that you, you know, have to figure in when you are developing, you know, property. But you know, that's all part of you know. Yeah, what but this you, is existing, so I'm just saying. Right. No, I understand. I mean, if you're talking about splitting your lot and you're talking about, you know, potentially building another um, home on it, and then. Uh, if that home is deemed to have to connect to the sewer, that route to, down to the street may be some distance, and you'll have to best determine how to do that at a cost-effective manner. Yeah. And that's all your cost as part of your development cost. So, oh, sir, I'm sorry. You don't need to be sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I remember what I want to ask you. Homeowner decides not to hook up. He runs up a tab of, I don't know, what you say the maximum was, 30 grand? Uh, in the scenario here, um, 16,000. Just, just a, an example. Mm -hmm. So the homeowner runs up a tab of 30 grand because he never hooked up. Now he sells the place. Is the new owner on for that 30 or does the clock start over? Unless the homeowner, the first homeowner, has said, come to us and said, I want to connect, there is no tab. It, the clock does not start over, though, to answer your question. Okay. So if you're near 31, it doesn't go in the, in the property sells. It's going to stay at that the higher num the highest number on that chart. Yeah. Yes. I thought you said earlier it's so much a year. For every year you don't hook up in bills. It, it's not a bill. It's just what the cost would be if you chose to connect. Wrong word. Yeah. So the cost it goes accumulates. Up. It, it does. It goes up. The thirty grand or so. Sure. Is a maximum. Uh, in this scenario, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the guy sells the place in ten years and. And he's up to 30 grand. Does that go on to the guy he sells it to? It doesn't go on to him or her unless they choose to connect. Oh, so if they choose to connect, they're starting at 30. They're starting at 30, yes. It doesn't oh, yeah. reset. I think they call that extortion in this state. But the reason it's set that way, or being proposed that way, is because under the other scenarios we've previously talked about, I'm not going to say the B word because I've said it a few <laughs> times tonight. But I'm, that amount doesn't change. It's the same every year. There is no discount on it. This scenario allows us to discount it to encourage people to connect. Thank you. You're welcome. But I did you want to add to that, Joe? You... Well, I was just going to you know, see if I can make the, the issue a little bit clearer. So a fee would be set for connection, the full cost connection. But with the discount table, it's it's a, it's starting at a, a significantly lower price, and in this chart here, every five years it'll it'll go up in price. Another five years passes, you'll have that that window of five years to connect at that same price, and then it'll go up again until it reaches the original fee that was determined as the full cost fee to connect, and that is 30 years out in this particular scenario. But why? Why does it keep going up? 
Well, the concept is we want to want to provide a discount. We want to set a uniform fee so everybody would, it'll be paying some portion of the project cost, you know, whether it be five, ten, or fifteen, or twenty percent of the project cost, divided by all the total bedrooms or equivalent bedrooms in the project area, because master General law requires us to use a uniform me method in determining what that fee would be. So we've done that to say, you know, if we look at this phase of the project and everybody connected and share the cost equally, it would be, you know, one of the numbers on the bottom yellow strip. Now we want to provide a discount of that number to encourage people to connect early. And so why does it increase? Because we have to establish the maximum fee, but we can allow discounts. We can't establish the maximum fee and then increase those fees over time. So who's we? The, 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 select board. Huh? the select board. The, any mass municipal town or city can, cannot do that. In our case, it would be the select board acting as sewer commissioners. So it would be between those five people whether you get the discount or not. S subject to a, to a hearing and right. a public process, but yes. Thank you again. You're welcome. Leanne? I think I just want to um, give it to you in a different way, if I could, that don't look at it as the price is going up. Look at it as the price is 30000 If you come in early, you're getting a discount. It's not that the price is going up. It's that you're getting a discount coming in early instead of just doing 30000 across the board from year one. Thank you, Leanne. Yes, sir. I'm going to present you a fantasy scenario. What happens, you know, all this is fantastic, the new development and everything else. What happens if one of the condo complexes along Main Street decides to tie in? If you go in by bedrooms, there's an awful lot of them in there. That's correct. I don't need that. I know. Thank you. So, uh, a scenario that I, if there was a 200 bedroom condominium complex, and it was 100 units, 100 apartments, with two bedrooms in each, yep. right? Their price, their cost, would be the number of bedrooms multiplied by one of the dollar amounts in this, uh, in, in this grid. It would be billed to the condominium association, and they would need to apportion it amongst their, their, the homeowners. And that's the exactly how it would happen. Yeah, exactly. It's not going on the tax bill. It's not getting right. not going on each individual okay. property tax bill. It's going to go all through because you can't connect one unit in a condominium complex. Well, it doesn't work. The units along Main Street have their own sewer treatment plant, so I would I would I wouldn't think that they would opt in anyway. But still, uh, there are some that I'm did. sure there is a need. There are others that have recently invested, and we understand that, and that's why we hope that making it be an option for them, but not required, right. would be advantageous. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you know, again, you know, the, the cost of septic system repair, you know, it's expensive and growing. Um, and, and we have found it's roughly between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars for a typical single family home. Those of you who live in Martin's Landing, some of you may be in the room, we've been told by um, your, the agent for your homeowners association it was about three million dollars to build build your treatment plant there. So um, the, the, it's expensive business and, and there's a significant range. Um, I talked a little bit about subdivision, the Board of Health and subdivision. Um, these are some sample rates, um, and I, I won't go through them in detail, but you'll, you'll see that they range from a low of $3.58 in Lawrence to a high of $9.24 in North Andover. That's for roughly 748 gallons of wastewater to be treated. When you average it all out, um, it, you end up with a quarterly bill of about $150. Uh, per quarter. So imagine, you know, if you were along the route and you chose to connect, you have a water bill that you get from the town every quarter right now. Imagine beyond the quarterly water bill, there would be a fee per 100 cubic feet or some other metric to measure how much water you used that would become a sewer fee. Again, only for those who choose to connect along the route. Just a little bit about the cost of operating a sewer system. Um, 
it varies from community to community. There are many factors, including the maintenance costs, the proximity to the plant. We are far away from the plant, as you know, uh, and the age of the system. Ours would be a new system. The long-term goal is to have fees from the users cover the cost of operating the system, similar to what happens with our current water system right now. The taxpayer does not subsidize with any tax money. The taxpayer pays a water rate every quarter, and that's what covers the cost of, uh, of operating the system. Um, in the earlier years, following the construction of the system, it's likely that the general fund or the taxpayer would need to subsidize to ease the burden on the users because it becomes a balancing act. You need to have a certain amount of flow in order for the system to work. The costs are spread amongst the users of the flow, uh, and it may not be a palatable rate without some assistance from a, a subsidy. Uh, and I'm going to give an example right now that we provide a subsidy <laughs> to uh, another enterprise. It's a technical term that the Department of Revenue uses, the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, it cannot fund itself solely on its user fees, so, so there is a subsidy that's provided. So the model is out there for that to happen. The amount of that uh, is, is uh, something that can only really be determined once you know what the connection rate is, and we just want to point that out to folks. I will note that system development fee revenues, they can be used to subsidize the cost of operating a source system. So as people are paying to connect because they've chosen to connect, perhaps they need to connect because their septic system, system failed and they really don't want to reconstruct it on their property, those revenues, that money being paid in, can be used to, to help fund the operation of the sewer system. Um, I'm not going to spend too much on this, but this just sh sort of shows a, a very high level summary of what a budget for operating a sewer system could look like. Salaries uh, and benefits totaling about $350,000. You know, items that would need to be worked out are the exact rate we would need to pay the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District and any rate that we might need to pay to move wastewater through either Andover, North Andover, or any other community along the route. Electricity, chemicals, and other expenses, those are costs that we would be trying to recover through a user fee for sewer, sewer, uh, sewer flow um, from the ratepayers. Uh, those are costs we would be trying to cover um, in, uh, within the budget. Very similar to what we do with our water system right now, only we're not paying to have the water treated we're paying to actually purchase the water from the town of Andover, as many of you know. So next steps in this process, and I appreciate your listening uh, and active participation this evening. Um, additional information sessions that will be scheduled. This was the third of three that were advertised in the water and trash bills uh, in the last quarter. Um, we are going to be looking to hear from uh, residential property owners such as yourselves. Uh, I think the condominium associations should expect to be contacted by the Director of Public Works to try to present um, to uh, your membership, and then commercial property owners as well. Uh, we're looking to have a special town meeting. A news flash, if you heard about a potential special town meeting on May 15th, that is not happening. We will conduct additional outreach and we expect that a special town meeting will take place uh, toward the end of June after the June 12th annual town meeting. And as we've mentioned before, because this project would be funded by a debt exclusion, primarily at town meeting, with the potential offset from funding through connections, we need to have a debt exclusion vote where we all go to St. Teresa's or we vote absentee. That would happen no more than 90 days after a special town meeting, in all likelihood in September, but that has not yet been determined. So I want to thank everybody for attending this evening and for your interactive participation. Um, I would just ask, you know, if uh, you, you heard some information here and you hear elsewhere information that maybe doesn't jive with what you heard, take the opportunity to point folks to the website to correct them to what you heard this evening. Um, you know, a very difficult series of information sessions in the fall focused on the concept of betterment that is no longer on the table. Um, you know, you may have strong feelings one way or the other, but what we want is for our residents to be informed and when it comes time to make a decision, make a decision based upon accurate information. Um, again, thank you very much for your time this evening. And, oh, Mr. Hayden. The most accurate information is tonight's information. That's correct, which will be posted. Wanted, yes. If you look at the one from March the 8th, it's not going to be as up to date as this one. That's correct. And we'll, we'll, I appreciate that feedback. We'll try to fix the way it's presented on this so that we can more accurately 
present information because people like I think are concerned or, or have been concerned and there, there are reasons to have questions and be concerned but betterments are not one of them at this point. I'm happy to see that betterments is not on. Sure. Sure. You're welcome. Okay folks, thank you and I wish you a good evening. <laughs>